On this Saturday night, the precious packages on their way to Canada. The logistics to protect the vaccine. Even something simpler like jostling the uh, vials can uh, destroy the vaccine. So it can eventually protect Canadians. The neurological impact of the virus. It feels like your brain is broken. What Canadian scientists are discovering. Plus, a granddaughter's love. People are reaching out to their seniors in their life. That's all I could ever ask for. And how it set off a chain reaction. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The COVID-19 vaccine is on a journey from Belgium to Canada. The first doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine are set to arrive on Monday to begin inoculating those at high risk. Further shipments will be coming by the end of the year. But as Jeff Semple explains, transporting the shots is a delicate process. Less than two weeks till Christmas, and UPS workers are preparing for a very special delivery. But instead of Santa, this package is from Pfizer and BioNTech. These photos show the first shipment of COVID-19 vaccines on its way to Canada. We have finally a light at the end of the tunnel. 30,000 doses were picked up from Pfizer's factory in Belgium on Friday and sent to Germany for processing. From there, they're heading to a UPS international logistics hub in Kentucky, transported in these high-tech coolers to keep the vaccine at minus 70 degrees. It's a shipper box about the size of like a carry-on suitcase, and then there's dry ice that goes around it, and then it has actually a device within it that has a continuous GPS and temperature monitor. So we will be able to have uh, continuous eyes on every shipper. By Monday, the vaccines will likely begin arriving at these 14 delivery sites across Canada, except for the territories because of challenges with cold storage. You have to have the cold chain with special refrigerators. And the other thing that's important is that when you do thaw the vaccine to give it, it's very unstable. So even something simple like jostling the uh, vials can uh, destroy the vaccine. Health Canada also warned anyone with allergies to the vaccine's ingredients should avoid it after two negative reactions in the UK. As far as uh, uh, the risk of allergies, we do list all the products that are in our vaccine so that people can see if they have a history against any of those ingredients. The company also concedes it's unsure how long the vaccine's immunity will last. The CEO telling CNN patients may require a repeat. I would not say seasonal, but maybe every two years. But if all goes according to plan, some at-risk Canadians could begin receiving the vaccine as early as Monday and not a moment too soon. Shoppers in Alberta and York Region near Toronto crowded into malls. A sudden Christmas shopping rush sparked by the news their communities are heading into lockdown. Trying to get in there before it closes on Monday. Uncle Mike, how are you doing? Oh Alberta just launched this colorful new ad campaign, warning that nobody loves a holiday gathering more than COVID. With Canada's case count projected to climb up to 12,000 per day by early January. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. It will be well into the new year before most Canadians can be vaccinated, so we need to keep following health guidelines. In many parts of Canada, we are nowhere close to flattening the curve. Both Quebec and Ontario recorded nearly 1,900 cases today. Manitoba reported 360 new infections. There were 274 new cases in Saskatchewan. Alberta reported 1,590 cases today. B.C. does not report on weekends. The United States surpassed 16 million COVID-19 cases today, so the FDA approval of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine couldn't come soon enough. It's a major turning point in a pandemic that has claimed nearly 300,000 lives in the U.S., but it reportedly took threats from the White House to get those vaccines rolling out. Jennifer Johnson reports. As about 3,000 Americans a day die of COVID-19, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Commissioner took to the airwaves, assuring Americans the just-approved Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is safe and is the country's best weapon against this virus. Science and data guided the FDA's decision. We worked quickly based on the urgency of this pandemic, not because of any other external pressure. On Twitter, U.S. President Donald Trump did pressure Dr. Hahn. 
There were reports the White House threatened to fire him if the vaccine didn't get approved Friday. The FDA chief dismissed those stories as the rollout of the doses begins. We expect 145 sites across all the states to receive vaccine on Monday. Another 425 sites on Tuesday and the final 66 sites on Wednesday. Emergency room Dr. Ben Usach will be one of the first in his state, Colorado, to be vaccinated. I am going to be one of the tips of the spear, one of the first people to step in to help generate this herd immunity, which is so important to us to get a grip on this terrible disease. Already there are concerns there won't be enough vaccines initially for all healthcare workers and nursing home residents. Pfizer BioNTech is exploring ways to scale up manufacturing. We remind the public to remain vigilant as inoculation will take time. Wear a mask, wash your hands, and remain socially distant when possible. The virus is spreading so rapidly, several states are out of ICU beds. Many morgues are filled to capacity. This one in Fort Worth, Texas, is racing to double its space. Doctors fear what's ahead as the Christmas holiday approaches. As physicians, we've been trained to help people, and it's really hard right now to feel helpless. Millions more vaccine doses may be available soon. Moderna's vaccine goes before the FDA's advisory panel for review December 17th, as America's grim death toll continues to rise. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Mexico, one of the worst hit countries in Latin America, has also authorized the vaccine for emergency use. It will receive 250,000 doses initially, enough to vaccinate 125,000 people. Frontline health workers will be the first to get the shots. The government has faced harsh criticism for its handling of the pandemic as case numbers and deaths keep rising. Mexico has the fourth highest death toll in the world, with more than 113,000 lives lost to COVID-19. The rate of fatalities is higher than any other country, 9.2 percent. And the average age of those dying in that country is 55. It's 75 in much of Europe. The development and approval of the COVID-19 vaccine happened at an unprecedented pace. Think about it. It's been less than a year since the novel coronavirus was discovered and genetically mapped. To give you an idea of how that compares, it took four years for the first successful mumps vaccine to go from development to approval. The earliest development of a polio vaccine began in 1935, but it wasn't until 1955 that an effective vaccine was administered to the public. And although there are treatments to prevent the transmission of HIV, there is still no vaccine against that virus nearly four decades after it was first discovered. The head of Pfizer Canada says Ottawa's policies are the reason why innovative new vaccines are not being manufactured in this country. There was a time in history when Canada had its own domestic production. And as scientists realize this vicious virus isn't going anywhere, is it time to make vaccines here at home? Let's go to Mercedes Stevenson and talk about her interview with the head of the Canadian division of Pfizer. Mercedes? That's right. We spoke with the head of Pfizer Canada, Cole Pinot. He says that Pfizer has successfully partnered with the Trudeau government to swiftly bring the COVID-19 vaccine to Canada. But when I asked him why there isn't a pharmaceutical facility in Canada capable of manufacturing the new vaccine, he put the blame squarely on Ottawa, saying the government's policies deter investment and innovation and that he's very concerned about new drug pricing changes which will come into effect this January. Pharmaceutical companies are concerned that by setting a ceiling on prices, innovative new medicines will not launch in Canada, and that that will, quote, deprive patients of potentially life-changing new treatments. We're very concerned with the proposed changes to the pricing reform, PMPRB as it's called, that is due to go, to in- go into effect on January 1st. Uh, This type of further restriction on the incentives to bring innovative new products to Canada really jeopardizes Canadians' opportunity to have breakthrough medicines and other therapies moving forward. So we'd really like to partner with the government. Unfortunately, over the past four years, 
we haven't been able to engage in a meaningful conversation. The government says that the new pricing guidelines that Mr. Pino is talking about will reduce the cost of drugs for Canadians by some $13 billion. Procurement Minister Anita Anand defended her government's work to procure COVID-19 vaccines and highlighted efforts to boost Canada's ability to develop pharmaceuticals here at home. We have invested $126 million in the NML facility in Montreal, as well as millions of dollars in research facilities across the country, including Invito Intervac out west. Uh, so we are working on a two-track system to make sure we have a very diverse portfolio of vaccines on the one hand and investing in domestic manufacturing and research on the other. The head of Pfizer Canada says he wants to work with Ottawa on a proposal to develop domestic manufacturing capabilities so that Canada would be in a better position if there's another pandemic. Robin? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thanks, Mercedes. Today is the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement, and world leaders are marking the milestone with a virtual gathering. The Climate Ambition Summit includes representatives from more than 70 countries, including Canada. All of them are pledging to increase their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. All of our countries are dealing with the health and economic impacts of the global pandemic. But as we look to rebuilding from this crisis, we must do so in a way that will build back better for all of our citizens. And that must include an ambitious plan to take strong action against climate change. U.S. governors attended the summit, but there was no federal government representative. President Donald Trump pulled the country out of the Paris Accord. But in a video released today, President-elect Joe Biden said the U.S. will rejoin the agreement on his first day in office. Coming up, the battle between Australia and social media giants. There's long been a debate about how tech giants have a huge sphere of influence. Just this week, New York's Attorney General said no company should have this much unchecked power. As Mike Gillet reports, Australia is looking at new laws aimed at Facebook and Google. They're aiming high down under. Australian lawmakers will soon be voting on the News Media Bargaining Code, legislation that would make Facebook and Google pay for journalism. This is a huge reform. This is a world first. And the world is watching what happens here in Australia. The fight has been brewing for years in countries all over the world. The tech giants use articles and stories from broadcasts and print media, yet don't share any of the ad revenue they generate with the companies that produce the work. And that's a significant amount of money. Combined, Google and Facebook control 76% of all online ad dollars in Australia. Our legislation will help ensure that the rules of the digital world mirror the rules of the physical world. Now, the counter argument has long been that Facebook and Google drive traffic to media websites. However, a recent report in Canada warned that media is being starved out of advertising revenue, with Google and Facebook controlling between 60 and 90 percent of the digital market. The fact is, is that these large communications organizations have been making money off the backs of Canadian journalists for years. The News Media Canada report found that at the same time newspaper ad revenue plummeted 43% between 2014 and 2019, Google's ad revenues more than doubled, while Facebook's increased fivefold. And the Canadian Association of Broadcasters predicts TV and radio here at home will face revenue shortfalls of over a billion dollars by 2022. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau promised to seek compensation for news content in the most recent throne speech. But media watchers say they'll likely wait and see what happens in Australia. And that fight could get ugly, with Australian media reporting Facebook is warning it might block content rather than pay for it, leaving the Australian government with no choice but to play hardball. It may be for a time to limit access uh, among Australians to having access to Facebook, which would not be a very popular move, I'm sure, but there are ways of pushing back against these large media companies. You can bet lawmakers around the world are watching closely. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. 
There is international condemnation tonight after Iran executed a journalist for his work that inspired the 2017 protests over high levels of inflation and unemployment. For years, Rohala Zam was given asylum in France, but last year he was tricked into traveling to the Middle East, where he was abducted by Iranian agents. Today, he was hanged after Iran's Supreme Court held up his conviction of fomenting violence. The 47-year-old ran a website, Ahmad News, which he used to spread embarrassing information about the president and the ruling class. A trio of codebreakers has cracked an encrypted message 51 years after it was sent to a San Francisco newspaper by the Zodiac Killer. The serial killer terrorized Northern California in the late 60s, taunting police and the public. Five people were murdered. The decoded message doesn't reveal an identity, but part of it says, that wasn't me on the TV show, suggesting police were never on the right track. The FBI says the coded message was solved by an American software developer, Belgian programmer, and Australian mathematician. Still ahead, brain fog, the impact of COVID-19 beyond a respiratory disease. The virus that's been plaguing the world is best known for causing respiratory illness. But the longer we live with it, the more we learn about COVID-19's other effects. In some people, it can cause debilitating neurological symptoms. There can be confusion, delirium, and strokes even in those with mild symptoms. Donna Friesen looks into the work being done by scientists to understand the impact on the brain. At first, Erica Taylor thought her symptoms were just a sinus infection. I honestly didn't think that I had COVID, but I got tested as a precaution. Her results came back positive. Over the next six weeks, she developed severe headaches, started losing her memory and getting confused. It feels like your brain is broken. Doctors call it brain fog, a common term to describe neurological issues that can include dizziness, memory loss, and the inability to find words. In November, researchers found between 10 to 35 percent of COVID-19 survivors in the U.S. experienced similar disabling and persistent neurological symptoms. Here in Canada, scientists are recruiting COVID-19 survivors to do MRIs on their brains, tracking any changes. The virus might impact the brain in certain people, impairing their activities of daily living. And so this is a healthcare issue and a societal issue. How COVID gets in the brain is not clear. One theory is tied to the loss of the sense of smell, that perhaps the virus invades the brain through the nasal cavity, getting into the orbitofrontal cortex. The brain is covered with a membrane called the dura, and the orbital frontal cortex actually doesn't have any dura. It's the only part of the brain that has this, this potential pathway. And so the virus can get in there. Graham says there is evidence COVID-19 can migrate from the orbitofrontal cortex to other parts of the brain, including areas responsible for controlling breathing and heartbeat. So there are examples of people who have only had neurological symptoms and not respiratory symptoms. And when it does, it's life-changing. Erica Taylor still can't work. She's on medical leave. I'm still struggling a lot. I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever get to the point where I'll be, be the same. Donna Friesen, Global News. And Donna will have more on the theories about the virus and the loss of smell tonight on The New Reality, right here on Global. Singer Charlie Pride has died from complications due to COVID-19. Sleeping under a table in a roadside park. Pride was considered the first black superstar in the world of country music. He won three Grammys and was recently honored with the Willie Nelson Lifetime Achievement Award. Outside of music, Pride was an athlete. He played baseball for the Negro American League from 1952 through 1958. And he stayed a baseball fan. In 2010, he became one of the owners of the Texas Rangers. Charlie Pride was 86 years old. Up next, a sweet birthday surprise reminds others to reach out. This slippery scene in Ukraine's capital is getting a lot of attention. People struggle to walk on ice-covered streets 
One poor soul just couldn't catch a break. She kept trying and trying. The police say the deep freeze caused over 100 car accidents in a single day. And removing the ice took more than 4,000 sweepers. This next story may remind us of the good there is in this world. An Alberta woman couldn't stand the thought of her grandma celebrating her birthday alone. Turning to social media, the granddaughter devised a sweet surprise. As Jill Croteau reports, her ideas sparked connections across the country. Here's a nice big one. It's a chilly December day. This is one from William. He's in grade two. But 95-year-old Rena Harris would willingly sit out here all day long. I can't believe it. You're 95 years young. What a milestone. Savoring every single birthday wish from people she's never even met. Sincerely, Doreen Stobie. Isn't that nice? Yes. Saskatchewan. Showing off a box full of treasured notes and cards. It sounds like you are truly loved by your family. She certainly is. Her granddaughter Vicky couldn't bear the thought of her spending her special day alone. So she recruited some people on Facebook to drop a card in the mail. It just exploded. So many people wanted to write her and it's been overwhelming a bit, to be honest, you know, that so many people want to celebrate with her. Oh, it's just great. <laughs> I just love mail. But something even more profound came from this call out for cards. It was very inspiring as well because people were writing back to me saying, you know, because of this post, I've sent a letter to my grandma or, you know, because of this, I've now called my grandma for the first time in years, you know, and so if at the end of the day it means people are reaching out to their seniors in their life, you know, um, that's all I could ever ask for. Now I'll get emotional. I thought it was really, really lovely, heartwarming, and uh, I think my husband and I did a good job raising her. Grandma Rena is planning on sending thank you notes back to those who thought of her. But you can count on this feisty lady to include one minor correction. I tell them I'm only 39. They got the wrong number. <laughs> the best, honestly. Um, I'm very blessed. I could only wish that any, everyone could have a grandma like mine. Jill Croteau, Global News. I'm sticking with 39 too. That is Global National for this Saturday. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is Tofino, BC. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.